e nga waka, e nga reo, e nga mana, tēnā koutou kato. E te hapori, o te kirikiri roo, o te rohi whānui, nō mai haramai, ki te whari wānaing o Waikato. Nga ahorangi, nga kai aoko, nga i kaumahi, me te tauira, hoki tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou kato. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you here uh, this evening, uh, particularly um, Professor Grant Samkin um, and his family, and also to the wider community uh, for his inaugural uh, professorial lecture. Professorial lectures are a very important part of the life of the university. As our new uh, professors uh, communicate to a wider audience about their life, their work and the contributions they make not only to the discipline but to the wider community. Grant was born in India uh, when his father worked in a tree plantation. As a child his family moved to England and then to Uganda before finally settling in South Africa where Grant attended secondary school and developed his lifelong passion for rugby. Grant completed a bachelor's uh, degree with honours in accounting science from the University of South Africa in Pretoria and a Master of Commerce with distinction from the University of uh, Durban, Westville and a PhD in Accounting from the University of South Africa. He was also a member of both the South African and New Zealand Institutes of Chartered Accountants. Before becoming an academic, Grant worked in the private sector. He lectured in accounting at the University of Durban, Westville for a number of years before immigrating to New Zealand in 1997. In the same year, Grant uh, secured a post as senior lecturer in accounting at the Waikato Management School, where he's been ever since. He was promoted to associate professor in 2010 and completed a postgraduate certificate in tertiary teaching in 2013. Grant has a genuine passion for teaching students, in particular, helping to develop their critical thinking and creativity so they have a lifelong tools to come up with their own ideas and solutions. He is co-author of a market-leading university textbook, New Zealand Financial Accounting, published six times between 2001 and 2013. It was the first financial accounting textbook to incorporate New Zealand equivalents to international accounting standards. Grant's research over the past 10 years is diverse, but can be categorised in three major themes narrative or non-financial reporting, accounting education issues, and accounting history. More recently, Grant's work is focused on developing an accounting framework to help key stakeholders measure an organisation's performance against environmental targets, such as contribution to biodiversity and natural capital. Grant has won a number of prestigious awards during his academic career. In 2014, he won a highly commended award from the Sustainability Accounting Management and Policy Journal for a paper on biodiversity reporting by New Zealand local authorities. In 2011, he won a highly commended award at the Emerald Literati Network Awards for Excellence for editing a special journal on the theme of accounting in the media. In 2008, introducing a learning portfolio in undergraduate financial accounting course won the British Accounting Association Special Interest Group Prize for the best paper published that year. Grant is the editor of, or associate editor of half a dozen journals including Accounting, Auditing and Accountability, Pacific Accounting Review, Accounting History, the Australasian Accounting Business and Finance Journal and the Meteorati accountancy research. It's my real pleasure now to welcome Grant for his inaugural professorial lecture. Thank you very much. And of course it doesn't work.
Deputy Vice-Chancellor, colleagues and family. It is with a great deal of trepidation that I present my inaugural lecture. <laughs> While others who have graced podiums such as this have acknowledged their career successes, every now and again it is useful to acknowledge and indeed reflect on a career built on failure, mistakes and accidents. My school results were without any merit whatsoever. I barely obtained a university pa entrance pass. Law was the only faculty that would accept me as a student. My first couple of years at university are worthy of mention, not by the grades I achieved, but rather the classes I was absent from, the assignments I did not complete, and the exams I did not sit. Now to many of you, particularly in the era of student loans, this would seem to be a waste of time and money. But I had carefully rationalized my position. As my school friends were undertaking two years of compulsory military service in the South African Defense Force, I felt that I had a window of opportunity to participate in a variety of extracurricular activities I had not been exposed to by virtue of my attendance at an all-male boarding school. Unfortunately, not all those in my immediate circle saw it this way. After my rather dismal first year results, I received the following ultimatum from my father. Get a haircut and get a job. This was indeed a shock. It was not an activity I took to with a great deal of enthusiasm. My search took me to the classified section of the newspaper where I found an advertisement for an article clerk. Now you would think that one would try and find out what an article clerk was before setting out for an interview. This was perhaps my first mistake. I didn't. I had an interview and was offered employment. I was given some green forms to sign, and as I was still not old enough to enter into a contract without parental assistance, one of my parents needed to co-sign the documents. And this is perhaps where I made the second mistake. I didn't read the forms. My father, however, signed them immediately. I had effectively indentured myself for five years as an article clerk, with my salary for the period of the contract clearly detailed. As part of this contract, I had to work full-time while studying part-time. So becoming an accountant was an accident of circumstances. My first day at work as a trainee member of the accounting profession was memorable for all the wrong reasons. I did not possess a suit, so I arrived at work resplendent in my school blazer and a tie. My first audit engagement took, me, took place on day one. I was delivered to a client by the partner in charge to undertake an attorney's trust account. Audit. The words attorney, audit, and trust account could have been ancient Farsi as far as I was concerned. Let's revisit what we have here. A failed lawyer, well, failed first year law anyway, someone with dismal school leaving results, and more importantly, had not studied accounting at school, and someone not yet old enough to enter into a contract without parental assistance, about to embark on a, an attorney's trust account audit. I was given the audit file, and if my memory serves me correctly, the following instructions. Grant, start with the bank reconciliation and follow what was done last year. I was then abandoned. But of course, there was a practical problem. As I had never had a bank account, I did not know what a bank reconciliation was. <laughs> After sitting staring at the previous year's working paper files for a couple of hours, the lady responsible for the trust accounts took pity on me and showed me what to do, including how to sample files for audit and which files to select, how to make the appropriate check marks in the files, and how to complete the audit program as evidence of the work I had done. Brilliant, I hear you say. You were indeed fortunate to get this uh, on-the-job training for an experienced accountant. And for many of you, this may not necessarily appear problematic. However, the purpose of an attorney's trust account audit is to ensure that attorneys do not use the money entrusted to them by their clients as a private or personal source of funds. As the South African Institute of Chartered Accountants explained shortly after I commenced my article, the temptation for misappropriation, fraud and theft 
makes attorney's trust accounts a lucrative target. Okay, so perhaps my first audit experience was not the best possible of, uh, example of on-the-job training. After completing articles and eventually qualifying as a chartered accountant, I held a number of accounting positions before a friend asked me to consider joining the University of Natal in Durban. This is where the title of this address comes from. The articles of clerkship document I signed was green. Also, in the pre-computer era, accounting and audit working papers were completed by hand. In the case of the firm where I worked, we used green multi-column paper. Audit check marks were made in green ink. Three years into my articles, the firm celebrated how progressive they were by moving to blue multi-column paper and audit check marks made in purple ink. By leaving the accounting and auditing profession, I had now moved beyond the green and purple. I was not at the University of Natal long before I was approached to join the University of Durban Westville. So in some ways, becoming an academic followed much the same unplanned path as becoming an accountant. My research agenda has introduced me to some fascinating people. Now for a number of you, the words accountant and fascinating do not belong in the same sentence. In fact, they probably should not belong in the same dictionary. The reason for this is that there is a stereotypical view of accountants as dull and uninteresting. This perception has been reinforced by popular culture, such as the following portrayal of an accountant by John Cleese. Ah, oh, Mr. Oh. Anchevin, <laughs> do sit down. Thank you. Take the weight off the feet, eh? Yes, yes. <laughs> Lovely weather for the time of year, I must say. Enough of this gay banter. And now, Mr. Andrew, <laughs> are you asked us to advise you which job in life you were best suited for? That is correct, yes. Well, I now have the results here of the interviews and the aptitude test that you took last week, and from them we've built up a pretty clear picture of the sort of person that you are. And I think I can say without fear of contradiction that the ideal job for you is chartered accountancy. <laughs> But I am a chartered accountant. Darling, <laughs> well, back to the office with you then. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. Right. You don't understand. I've been a chartered accountant for the last 20 years. I want a new job. Something exciting that will let me live. Well, chartered accountancy is rather exciting, isn't it? Exciting? No, it's not. It's dull. 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 My God, it's dull. It's so desperately dull and tedious and stuffy and boring and desperately dull. Well, uh, yes, Mr. Angevy, but you see, uh, your report here uh, says that you are an extremely dull person. <laughs> you see, our experts describe you as an appallingly dull fellow, unimaginative, timid, lacking in initiative, spineless, easily dominated, no sense of humor, tedious company, and irrepressibly drab and awful. <laughs> and uh, whereas in most professions, these would be considerable drawbacks, in chartered accountancy, they're a positive boon. <laughs> then you see, I came here to find a new job, a new life, a new meaning to my existence. Can't you help me? Well, do you have any idea of what you want to do? Yes. Yes, I have. What? Lion taming! <laughs> yes, yes. Where accountants are portrayed in films, they are often depicted as villains or rogues. For example, in the film The Producers, accountant Leo Blum comes up with a brilliant scheme to build money from investors in a show that is guaranteed to be a flop. In The Shawshank Redemption, accountant and convicted murderer Andy, Andy manages to avoid being assaulted by other inmates by completing the prison guard's tax returns. He also uses his accounting knowledge to help the prisoner uh, prison governor hide money off the books. The re recent release of the film, The Accountant, was a cause for celebration by our profession. The Waikato and Bay of Plenty branches of the Institute of Chartered Accountants Australia and New Zealand considered this belated recognition of our profession to be so momentous that they offered private screenings to members. Behind the cover of, the, of an accounting office, the main character, Christian Wolfe, works as a freelance accountant for some of the world's most dangerous criminal organizations. He is also skilled in murder and mayhem. Personally, I am not so sure that this is the best example of an accountant that the two local branches of the institute could come up with. 
My accounting research provides me with the opportunity to dispel the myth of accountants as dull and uninteresting. I try to focus on characters that may not necessarily be traditional accountants, but who are colorful and exude a sense of adventure. Perhaps my focus comes from the games of my early childhood that in the current environment would be considered inappropriate, coupled with my consumption of boys' own adventure novels. There is, a, there is, of course, an alternative explanation that you may wish to consider. Drawing on the video, you could argue that as an accountant, I am dull, tedious, uninspiring, spineless, lacking initiative, stuffy and boring, and so can only live vicariously through the exploits of others. Let me introduce you to some of the people I've known. John Pringle was the focus of, the, of Trader Sailor Spy, the case of John Pringle and the transfer of accounting technology to the Cape of Good Hope. This article is a microhistory where archival material supplemented with existing literature is used to tell a story that provides insights into individuals and the little nuggets of history. John Pringle was the illegitimate son of John Pringle, who represented Selkirkshire as a member of parliament. He obtained a commercial education in arithmetic and bookkeeping from the William, uh, Reverend William Rutherford before joining the East India Company as a writer. In 1793, and at the age of 24, he was appointed agent to the Cape of Good Hope by the East India Company's secret committee. This appointment was facilitated by Henry Dundas, who at the time was Secretary of State of War in the British government, as well as President of the Board of Control of the East India Company. Part of Pringle's job description was to collect military intelligence on French naval activities in the Indian Ocean, as well as political, commercial, and botanical information. Effectively, he was a spy for the East India Company and indirectly through Henry Dundas to the British government. When Pringle realized that the plans for an ex expedition against Mauritius was unlikely to take place, he left the Cape for St. Helena. He was not there long before he received news that the Dutch were likely to enter the war against England. He immediately formulated plans for invading the Cape with the St. Helena garrison. He justified his decision as follows. If something is not immediately, immediately done, the French at Mauritius and the Dutch at the Cape will join and become most dangerous enemies to our possessions in the East. This is a brilliant boy's own adventure of a 24-year-old working for a major commercial organization prepared to plan and participate in an invasion of a colony of a sovereign state. So why is this important from an accounting perspective? From the second half of the 17th century, the East India Company had been relatively uninhibited when transferring accounting, a soft technology, to their factories in India and elsewhere. However, there were significant non-technical factors that needed to be overcome in transferring accounting technology to the Cape of Good Hope, not least war with France. The use of microhistory in the narrative of John Pringle provides some insights into the difficulties faced by an individual and their interaction with others, particularly superiors. Within an organization when transferring accounting technology, something that would not readily be, readily be discernible from the examination of conventional East India Company. The second individual I will introduce you to is Lieutenant Colonel Edward Nichols. From his obituary in the Times, dated 9th of February, 1865, why would he not be a boy's own hero? I like the fact he can kill the French captain in single combat. <laughs> what my co-author Graham Francis and I set out to do in the, art in the article, Accounting Artifacts as a Means of Augmenting Knowledge of the Past, the case of Chief Hillis Hadjajo and Lieutenant Colonel Edward Nichols, was to demonstrate how an accounting artifact from the British colonial era can be used to augment knowledge of the past. What concerned us were the nature of the conflicting secondary sources surrounding presence given to the Native American chief for his assistance to the British, particularly Nichols, in the War of 1812. This was the war being fought in America and should not be confused with the war against Napoleon that was occurring concurrently in Europe. 
The account in the Niles Weekly Register of 1817 reports Hillis Hadejo being introduced to the Prince Regent while dressed in the most splendid suit of red and gold, and by his side he wore a tomahawk mounted in gold. In his biography, Jackson, later President of the United States, inflates the number of presents received to include a gold-mounted tomahawk, a diamond snuff box, and a sum of money. The number of presents increases with each telling to also include 500 pounds in gold, jewels for his daughter, as well as handsome presents of dresses, shoes, and bonnets, and much unaccustomed finery. So in the case of uncertainty, what do we do? We go back to the original archives. We essentially undertook an audit to uncover the truth and understand the artifact through the haze of 200 years of propaganda. Our investigation found that Hillis Hadojo received two presents in addition to those shown in the artifact. They were a brace of pistols and an ornamental pipe hatchet. Academic references to his hatred of the white man and his refusal to wear white man's clothing is inconsistent with the description of the Western clothing detailed in the artifact as being provided to him by Nichols. The artifact also provides us with evidence of how the containment of indigenous people occurred. That is, how colonial governments provided indigenous people with presence of, as a form of man, manipulation designed to encourage certain actions. In this case, farming rather than, than engaging in armed conflict with the American military. My work on the Reverend John Clay is what I term opportunistic, opportunistic research in that it came about as a result of work into my family history. As you can see from the photographs, the family resemblance is indeed remarkable. John Clay was considered to be a very dull child. His son described him as amiable, tractable, but apparently hopelessly inert. Drawing on the video clip played earlier, John Clay possessed the perfect personality to be an accountant. His initial schooling was at the private academy run by Mr. Wiley, where he received a commercial education with a thorough training in accounts. However, his schooling was considered deficient in that it contained uh, a smat uh, no Greek, only the rudiments of Latin, and a smattering of French. However, what makes John Clay a true accounting hero was a stand against the scourge of burial clubs that existed in Lancashire and surrounding countries, counties during the first half of the 19th century. In an 1853 letter to William Brown, MP for South Lancashire, he set out his concerns with the unintended consequences of poorly thought out and drafted legislation in the form of the Friendly Societies Act, 9th and 10th Victoria. Although not a, tr a traditional accounting document, it is John Clay's account of the inadequacy of the legislation. He argues that a financial incentive remained for parents to commit an infanticide. Arsenic, sulfuric acid, and neglect were the tools used by parents. Evidence of a single child being registered in up to 19 burial clubs, as well as hired nurses speculating on the lives of infants committed to their care, were also highlighted. What I set out to do in the paper, The Experienced Chaplain of the Jail, was to understand the letter as well as the annual reports of the Preston House of Correction for the period 1824 to 1858, prepared by John Clay in the context of accounting documents. What I found is that these annual reports can, be, can perhaps be viewed as a precursor to a modern organization's non-financial or narrative reporting. Over the last three decades, the accounting profession has not covered itself with glory. The print media in particular has correctly highlighted the shortcomings of our profession, as can be evidenced by the following few media headlines. In the number of the stories, the reporters make it clear that the big four global accounting firms are the masterminds behind multinational tax avoidance schemes, which cost governments and their taxpayers an estimated one trillion US dollars a year. They are not alone in holding this view. This brings me to the final person I have known, Professor Prem Seeker. Accountants are not usually seen as activists. A possible reason for this is that as a discipline, accounting is inherently conservative. Words such as conservatism and prudence permeate our vocabulary. 
Although a number of prominent academics have acknowledged the important role activism can play in creating a more caring and progressive society, little incentive exists, currently exists for us to engage in this activity. Any activism that does occur is sporadic, intermittent, and short-lived. For many individuals, Prem Sekha is accounting's moral compass. Within the accounting community, Sekha is arguably unique in that he is the most prolific and long-lived accounting academic to engage in the genre of work described as academic activism. What I set out to do in my paper, Engagement with the Third Space, was to use Baba's conceptualization of third space and post-colonialism to understand Sekha's use of the print and electronic media to bridge the academic activist binary. While the concepts of colonizer, colonized and colonizer have traditionally been seen as a relationship between the developed Western world and undeveloped world, it can apply equally to the modern global economic and political environment, where one economy or organization views itself as advanced and developed and the other as failing, marginal, and backward. Through the use of electronic media and blogs, Sika has moved beyond the academy. He has set out to mobilize transform transformative action and forge alliances and has attempted to create the possibility for fermenting emancipatory change framed in, uh, framed in terms of social justice and equity. He uses his work as an academic accountant to challenge the dominant power structures in global economic systems, including the colonizing activities of professional accounting firms, regulatory bodies, and multinational corporations. While my teaching focuses on the technical financial statements portion of the annual report, it is the non-financial or narrative components that, in my view, provide the most interesting insight into organizations. As documents, annual reports have become increasingly sophisticated, creative, and range in length from under 50 to in excess of 900 pages. Cutting-edge print techniques, text, visual images, including stop-motion animation, photographs, abstract artwork, figures, and graphs, coupled with the bold use of color, is used to supplement and enhance tr the traditionally legal, uh, legally required accounting data. Some of my research into narrative reporting has focused on how two New Zealand organizations, the Department of Conservation and the New Zealand Police, have used their annual report narratives to respond to negative portrayal or criticisms of them, particularly by the print media. In the article, Accountability, Narrative Reporting and Legitimation, the case of a New Zealand public benefit entity, my co-author Annika Schneider and I examined how the Department of Conservation utilized informal reporting disclosures in addition, in addition to formal accountability mechanisms to pursue organizational legitimacy. We used five controversial issues to illustrate how DOC used impression management te techniques in the annual report narratives to gain and repair organizational legitimacy. These were the Kamanawa wild horse cull, the Cave Creek disaster, the use of 1080 poison, the conservation of protected species, and high country pastoral stations. In response to media criticism, criticism of the Kamanawa wild horse cull, DOC made use of reactive legitimation strategies to educate and inform stakeholders that its actions to protect and restore New Zealand's natural heritage were the most appropriate available. Assertive impression management techniques were used to focus on the pos positive conservation outcomes to the central North Island tussock country from reduced horse herd numbers. The Cave Creek disaster of the 28th of April 1995 was a crisis of legitimacy. A reactive legitimation strategy was used in the 1995 and 1996 annual reports to educate and inform stakeholders about the organizational changes that had taken place and the controls implemented to ensure that a similar event would not reoccur. Defensive impression management techniques, including the use of apologies, justifications, and explanations of why the event occurred and expression of remorse were also used to repair legitimacy. DOC makes use of 1080 poison to control pests, particularly possums. In response to earlier criticisms of its use, 
a reactive legitimation strategy was used to educate and inform stakeholders of DOC's dependency on the poison. Continued failure to gain stakeholder acceptance for the use of 1080 saw DOC adopt a proactive legitimation strategy in later annual reports while continue to, continuing to use education campaigns, public meetings, and results monitoring in, in an effort to obtain ex acceptance from stakeholders for its validity as practitioners. Photographs showing 1080 being used were also included in the annual report to illustrate the appropriateness of this form of pest control, particularly in remote and rugged forest blocks. Photographs of humans handling the poison were used to convince stakeholders of the relatively low risk posed by its use. In response to criticisms of its ability to protect endangered species, proactive legitimation strategies were used. Emotive symbols or, photogra or photographs of conservation icons in their natural environment were used to deflect attention away from DOC's inability to protect flora and fauna at risk uh, of extinction. Self-enhancement was used to change stakeholder perception of DOC's performance as an irresponsible landowner and manager. To maintain legitimacy for its control over the high country pastoral stations, transferred to its management from the 10-year review process, DOC made use of a case study coupled with photographs to emphasize the important role Molesworth Station would play in future conservation efforts. In a liberal democracy, the concept of police legitimacy is widely recognized and accepted. What this means is that the performance or behavior of individuals in organizations, such as the New Zealand police, whose claims to legitimacy are based on a high level of trust, must be able to stand scrutiny. In the article, Repairing Organisational Legitimacy, the case of the New Zealand Police, co-authored with Cliff Allen and Kristen Wallace, we examined three events that resulted in what we term a crisis of confidence in the New Zealand Police. These were the Stephen Wallace shooting, allegations of sexual misconduct, and Irina Asher. We found that the New Zealand police made good use of image repair discourse strategies. In the immediate aftermath of the Stephen Wallace shooting, photographs in the 2000 annual report show male police officers in a variety of community-related uh, roles. For example, there is a photograph of the police commissioner attending a pofery at a marae, a police officer investing a home break-in, while another shows a police officer talking to a farmer. These photographs are an attempt to shift the discourse of the New Zealand police from a brutal and racist police service to one that is humane and equitable and in touch with all sectors of society. In the aftermath of the claims of sexual misconduct made against Assistant Commissioner Clint Rickard and two former policemen, and the attempted cover-up of an inadequate investigation into pack rape allegations, Clever use was made of two particular photographs in the 2005 annual report. The first is a full shot, a face shot of a policeman looking to the left. He is wearing the police uniform of dress cap and shirt with epaulets and tie. There is no caption and the image is unremarkable in that the policeman could represent every man. His face is pleasant, he is clean shaven and his gaze to the left of the camera is non-confrontational. The second photograph is that of a policewoman. Again, there is no caption, but her uniform matches that of her male counterpart. She is photographed outside, sitting or leaning against the wooden bench, looking at the camera with a cheerful smile. At a connotative level, the represented representation of a policeman as being normal, a father, son, brother, can be contrasted with the image of Clint Rickard that was circulating during the period. Rickards was a large and physically powerful man with a shaved head and heav heavily tattooed forearms. Taken together with the first image, the second image of the police wo woman works to position both police officers as equals. With the Arena Asher case, the New Zealand police used a combination of image repair, uh, repair discourse strategies in the annual report narratives to evade responsibility 
while at the same time detailing the corrective action taken by the organization. I believe that organizations will increasingly focus on biodiversity and natural capital related reporting. It will therefore be necessary to develop tools that are, able to that are able to provide insights into the extent, nature, and changing levels of corporate natural capital disclosures. In our article, Developing a Reporting and Evaluation Framework Biodiversity, my co-authors, Annika Schneider and Daniel Tappan, had three clear objectives. The first was to develop a novel framework for biodiversity reporting. We drew on the strategic and performance management literature to develop a broad framework comprising three primary and 13 subcategories. The second was, an application, was the application of the framework to an organization to analyze the changes in the nature and level of biodiversity-related disclosures over time. The exemplar organization we selected was the New Zealand Department of Conservation. We wanted to understand whether changes in biodiversity-related disclosures mean that organizations whose operations impact biodiversity appreciate its importance. What we envisaged was that through developing the framework, intra-entity and inter-entity comparisons of biodiversity reporting practices could be made. Finally, we set out to establish the extent to which the disclosures made by the exemplar organization reflect the eight platforms of deep ecology. We believed that this would provide a useful structure through which, the, which insights into the tension between conservationists and those wishing to use, develop, and exploit the conservation estate could be obtained. There are a number of important implications for organizations arising from this study. First, it provides a, structure, a structured approach to presenting and analyzing narrative biodiversity disclosures. It provides a means through which biodiversity disclosures can be analyzed and compared. It provides an initial framework that could be developed further, refined, and adapted. While the application of the eight platforms of deep ecology to corporates is potentially problematic, it represents the starting point for a deeper level of engagement with biodiversity issues. While the deep ecological principles that guide human thought and actions towards a more harmonious coexistence with nature are particularly relevant to conservation departments, they are arguably equally applicable to corporations whose operations impact biodiversity. Although it is unrealistic to expect, to expect organizations to adhere to all eight platforms of deep ecology, the majority of the platforms contain achievable objectives that profit-seeking entities can aspire to. The final part of my lecture, lecture looks at where we are going. I will maintain an ongoing relationship with some of the individuals I've got to know through my research. For example, one of my current projects is, is examining the accounting budgets by, prepared by Lieutenant Colonel Edward Nichols for one of his grandiose colon, colonizing schemes and the reasons behind its failure. Integrated reporting and global reporting initiatives means uh, requirements means that corporates and other reporting entities will place an increasing emphasis on how their operations impact, impact the, various, the various elements of natural capital. To this end, the funding that my colleagues from the Waikato Management School and I have received from the university means that the work on the, the development of a natural capital reporting framework can continue. I do not believe that we fully understand the reasons for the decisions managers take when they prepare annual reports and non-financial accounting narratives. One of the reasons for this is that the vehicles through which corporate narratives are disseminated continue to change and now include websites and social media platforms, in addition to the, in addition to the traditional print format. Additionally, the forms that accounting narratives take are evolving. Finally, as I suggested earlier in the lecture, as a profession, we have, been sub we have been the subject of valid criticisms from a number of quarters. While as a profession, we focus on the words such as transparency and the development of accounting standards intended to provide transparent financial reporting, the profession itself is far from transparent and fails to consider their public interest role. Internationally, the big four accounting firms have been complicit in transfer pricing and tax avoidance strategies aimed at minimizing the tax paid by their clients, both in the countries they are domiciled in, but more importantly, in developing countries.
How the, prof how the modern accounting profession operates will require extensive research. Obtaining access to the profession and senior players, in particular from the big four accounting firms, will require caution, creativity, and initiative. In addition, the accounting profession will need to acknowledge the public interest role they play and accept the need to become more open and transparent. I appreciate having been provided with this opportunity to make the presentation this evening and share a bit of who I am and what I do with you. Thank you. I'm Deborah Willis, I'm the Acting Dean of the Waikato Management School and it's my pleasure to thank Professor Samkin for his lecture. These lectures provide an opportunity for newly appointed professors to share their insights from their current research. And in this particular case, Professor Samkin provided a broad context for the development of accounting framework. All academic research relates to a search for truth and the asking of critical and challenging questions. And this was certainly applied throughout the lecture in the context of, of Grant's research. It's very easy to cling to stereotypes, whether they relate to national or ethnic characteristics or to members of a profession. And as we saw today, accountants are not immune to the application of stereotypes. And I, I have to admit that my image of accountants is certainly inconsistent with the historical examples that um, were shared with us tonight. The lecture shows the impact of historical context on the activities of a particular profession and of relevance today is the central place of professional ethics and certification by accreditation bodies. Nevertheless, it, in this apparently neutral sphere of the um, narrative annual report and the involvement of accountants and enterprises that can be best described as questionable. I think this contributes, um, or has done in the past, to some scepticism about claims about corporate behaviour and, in the case of the lecture, the way in which information was presented uh, by government agencies. The accounting framework that Grant has been working on has the potential to increase the level of transparency and to explicitly focus stakeholders on ensuring that the organisations that they are participating in or they're, they're a part of their community operate sustainably and act in the best interests of that community. So thank you all very much for coming. Please join me in thanking Professor Samkin one more time and there are drinks and nibbles outside. Thank you.